So I'd like to <coughs> welcome Riz Dickhoff, who you probably all know. Um, and many thanks for to him for agreeing to give this talk. Um, over to him. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so let me first say that um, in Hamburg here it's snowing, but I have a little gadget which I brought um, the last time from my visit in Barcelona, which um, which reminds me, you know, which is a good memory. So do you know which place this is? The local people will know. It's uh, Montserrat. So. so it's a good habit to bring coffee mugs from conferences these days, because then um, at least in the mornings you can... Uh, imagine you're in sunnier places so anyway so thanks very much for um giving me the chance um to present here so what i'd like to talk about is um is a certain result which uh, fits into the context of categorification <clears throat> it's a categorification of um of the well-known dalt khan correspondence and so this is what i'd like to explain today and use it as a chance to somehow also explain this type of categorification, which plays a role um, in the statement and the proof of this result. And um, then I'd also like to explain. Oh, you are now unmuted. I just got muted, so <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, and then um, I'd also like to explain some applications. Okay, so here's the. Um, outline of the talk, the plan of the talk. So we will start with some um, some historical appetizer, I call it, because it's mainly just for fun and for entertainment. But um, it also serves um, to put us in place um, as a starting point for trying to understand what this Dalt Khan correspondence tells us um, on the level of numbers. So we will see this on three different layers of categorifications. Um, First level will be numbers, second level will be abelian groups, and then the third level will be stable infinity categories. And so <clears throat> maybe before we get there, let me explain a little bit about um, this idea of categorification, even though probably most of you will be familiar with it. It's maybe in the first instance the idea to, um, to start with a number, which is typically maybe an invariant of some form, and try to replace it by an abelian group. Okay, so this is typically some creative process, so it's not completely clear how to do it, but you have to invent something new, and then um, you would maybe hope to recover the number that you have started with by passing to an invariant of the abelian group, um, which, let's say, could be the rank. Mm, okay, so maybe <clears throat> a good historic instance of that type of codification is, um, is maybe the replacement of Betty numbers of um, topological spaces with um, homology groups. So this you know, sort of led to um, quite a revolution in the subject, actually turned a subject which before then was called combinatorial topology into what is actually now known as algebraic topology, as we all know it. And so I don't have to explain here that there's some benefit in doing this. Um, you can improve your understanding by passing to these abelian groups and also get some more refined information, and so forth. And so then um, there's going to be a second layer of um, categorification, which maybe in this example of um, invariance of topological spaces, you can somehow imagine as a process of trying to equip these abelian groups with more structure, such as, for example, you can put some, um, some composition law on the cohomology groups, which is a cup product. And so that turns these abelian groups into even more structured objects with with um, with uh, with a certain composition law, and so well, there's a certain there's a certain instance of that which we will apply um, um, today to replace abelian groups by um, a structure of higher categorical nature, which is going to be a stable infinity category, and then there's also a mechanism to go back to the original abelian group by just looking at the Grothendieck group of the stable infinity category. Okay, and so this is now what's, um, what we're going to do in the main part of the talk is we're going to explain how we can get from this correspondence of on the level of numbers to a correspondence on the level of abelian groups to a correspondence on the level of stable infinity categories. And then we'll explain what kinds of structures we, we, we can extract um, from this correspondence in the, in the third level and what, um, 
potential applications could look like. Okay. So, um, so, and I, I tried to uh, keep this the, the discussion as elementary as possible somehow because uh, I was told that this is supposed to be of a talk of a sort of introductory nature, maybe possibly, and so I, I try to um, stick with that. So, um, let's therefore start with um, some, um, as I said, historical appetizers. So it's you know sort of a um, uh, a situation which then. Um, from the from the perspective of content will not have um, much to do with what we will do later but the structures that we're interested in actually appear in this very classical um, story so that's why i'd like to take it as a starting point um, and explain it to you um, because i think it's also just fun um, independently um, so what are we doing we're starting with a holomorphic function on the complex plane and now we would like to study this holomorphic function in two different ways. Okay, so the first way is probably actually the more familiar way. Um, the first way is to study this function with um, what we call infinitesimal calculus. Okay, so the central construction, of course, is then the derivative of this function, um, which is um, which is obtained by this limiting process of these um, difference quotients, and um, then there's another way to analyze the function, which is um, difference calculus. And in difference calculus, I don't um, refer to this limiting process, but I actually just take this discrete difference between the value of a function at um, z plus one and z. Okay, so in other words, I, I could think of this as putting in h equals to one in this expression, and then I just don't take the limit. Okay, and so now we'll sort of develop these two perspectives um, based on this notion of um, taking a derivative. So in the one sense, it's a discrete derivative, and the other sense is this infinitesimal version. So let's look at what happens to certain <coughs> sort of model type functions. Um, the, the first one we would like to look at is just a polynomial, monomial even, z to the k, and then taking a derivative leads to this algebraic rule of um, multiplying by the exponent and then decreasing the exponent by one. Well, it turns out there's a total analog of that in this difference calculus. And so this is uh, an expression which is uh, what is called the falling factorial, um, which is exactly the expression as written. And it turns out that it behaves formally precisely the same way um, as um, the monomial. Okay, so if I apply the difference, um, the difference operator to it, then I get precisely this expression on the right. So um, now what can we do with this in this context? Well, in the context of holomorphic functions, um, the idea is now that I can actually use um, this notion of a derivative to um, give an approximation of this function in terms of its Taylor series because okay, so it is the original date, which I think Taylor introduced this notion of a series, um, not in the context of holomorphic functions, but uh, somewhere else. But so then the kind of um, surprising uh, fact, which, um, which everybody learns in, in some basic introduction to complex analysis, is that this Taylor series, it always um, approximates the function. So, um, and so this is, you know, it goes back to to basically the Cauchy integral formula. So, yeah, so, um, and it's sort of surprising because I, it means I can recover um, the function on the whole complex plane by looking at an, um, what uh, an algebraic geometer maybe thinks of as an infinitesimal neighborhood of the origin of this function. Okay, so, and now it turns out that there's um, just a completely analogous story for difference calculus, which um, is maybe um, a little less popular. And this was actually introduced even earlier. Namely, um, this was introduced by Newton in, um, in his uh, famous work Principia. And so, so there um, he provided the analog of the Taylor series, but using these difference operators here. Okay, and so what you can somehow what you can somehow convince yourself um, rather quickly is that this is a function on the right hand side um, whose values on the natural numbers actually agree with the original values of the function f of c. Okay, so in fact, you can completely recover, and that's going to play um, 
the decisive role in the subsequent discussion, you can actually completely recover um, the the values of all these um, of all these difference operators at zero from the values of this function f on the natural numbers. Okay, so now it turns out it's actually it's actually um, more subtle. So it's actually not true that this um, will always converge to the original function, but there's a, some rather subtle um, growth conditions uh, that this function has to satisfy near infinity. And so maybe if you're interested in, there's a, a theorem, which actually I didn't know before of, which is a theorem, which is called Carlson's theorem. And that um, gives you conditions under which the Newton series actually um, really approximates the function. Right? So it's clear that somehow this cannot um, work in all generality because, for example, there is non-zero functions um, such as um, if you take sine of pi z, that's a non-zero um, that's a non-zero holomorphic function, but if I restrict it to the natural numbers, I just get zero. And so, so therefore this function clearly cannot be approximated by its Newton series. But anyway, it's a fun subject and it's sort of this parallel world um, to infinitesimal calculus given by this discrete version of the derivative. Okay, so why do we... Um, care about this now that we're um, interested in discussing some um, algebraic story, namely the dalt kahn correspondence. Okay, so the reason why we care about it is because hidden, hidden in this um, game of forming the Newton series and trying to recover the values of the functions, at least at the natural numbers, there is actually purely algebraic correspondence. And um, this is the following, okay. That's going to be correspondence between um, sequences of complex numbers and sequences of complex numbers, okay? And so um, the, the example we should have in mind now is that, so how does this relate to this, um, to this original Newton series? Well, this could be um, the values of this function that we have started with, the holomorphic function at the, at the natural numbers. So we could have that A, um, n is actually just f of n. Okay, so, and then what are, what is this coefficients um, b i? So these would then be the coefficients of the Newton series. So coefficients of Newton series of f. Okay, now if you work this out, so that means um, what are the formulas? These are the formulas. I just start with um, the sequence a n. It could be the values of the holomorphic function f, but now I don't even have to start with the holomorphic function. I could just start with any sequence of um, complex numbers, and then I could associate the values of these difference of these iterated difference operators, always evaluated at zero. We just um, observed already in this discussion that these um, that these um, numbers here, they only depend on the values of the functions uh, f uh, at the natural numbers. And so therefore that makes sense just in terms of the sequence. And then I can go back. Um, and so how do I go back? Well, I recover the value of the function at the natural, uh, the natural numbers. It's an easy, easy, easy thing to check. Um, if you just evaluate this Newton series at a natural number, then it actually just becomes a finite, um, it actually just becomes a finite sum, and it recovers precisely the number that you have started with. Okay, so this term this, <clears throat> term this um, under the name Newton correspondence, um, which therefore, if you want, um, uh, at least in this context here, goes back to, to, to really Newton himself. Okay, so and now um, the um, the first thing that um, we would like to do is um, to replace this um, correspondence of numbers by a correspondence um, that has to do with not sequences of numbers but sequences of abelian groups. So that's going to be the game to be played. And uh, this is now something that um, presumably most of you are familiar with. So this is exactly the dalt kahn correspondence from homological algebra. So um, what's somehow interesting now here is that um, to lift this correspondence from numbers to abelian groups, there's going to be more structure involved. 
and that turns out to actually to makes the ob to make the objects that are related um, different from one another, right? So um, in first ap approximation, of course, these are both um, sequences of abelian groups, but then the algebraic structure that relates them uh, is um, is different uh, on both sides, and so this is of course this is a typical phenomenon of categorification that um, by doing this um, you somehow have more algebraic structure involved, which then also tells you more. Okay, and so here's therefore um, the statement is the Dalt Kahn correspondence um, proven independently by Dalt and Kahn in 1958. And it tells us that um, rather surprisingly, um, even though these um, objects here actually look quite different, there is actually an equivalence of, um, of categories relating simplicial abelian groups and chain complex of abelian groups. Okay. And so how does it go? Um, let me remind you, um, this is maybe the, the kind of um, the, the direction which is, um, which is probably most familiar with. It's exactly this process of starting with a simplicial abelian group and then totalizing it, so to say, um, to form its corresponding chain complex. Right? So there's actually, um, at this, um, at this um, situation, there's actually two different things or, or other uh, things you could do. Um, you could, for example, just take the terms A and separately and then take the alternating sum of the differentials. That's actually fine. That's going to give you a complex. But what we do here is we mod out by a certain subcomplex of degenerates, which doesn't contribute to um, the homology anyway. And so therefore, and also it's important to do it if you really want this to be um, an equivalence of categories. Okay, so this is what the symbol here means. It means it's it's basically, so let's write this maybe. It just means there is two different ways actually to realize this. Um, let me just write one of them. It's you take a n and then, and then you mod out by the abelian group, which is um, generated by all the degenerate simplices. So let me just, just write modulo degenerates. Okay, so and then you just form this alternating sum and then it's this uh, basic computation that if you do it twice, um, then the differential actually squares to zero. Okay, so, um, and now, um, of course, we know that there are many constructions um, which arise exactly in this way. For example, this is how we produce uh, the simplicial homology of a topological space. But there is also other constructions in homological algebra which um, arise in that way. For example, um, you can get the Hochschild um, complex, which computes Hochschild homology of an associative algebra by, um, by forming precisely such a simplicial object and then totalizing it and so forth. And so somehow, um, in some sense, the fact that um, many um, constructions of complexes, let's say in homological algebra, arise from simplicial abelian groups is somehow not a coincidence. That's somehow what this correspondence tells you, because in fact, every um, chain complex of abelian groups um, it actually arises via this construction. Yeah, and so you can even provide um, an explicit um, inverse um, formula for this construction. So here I've just written down a formula which, in which it's kind of a bit, a bit awkward to actually see that this forms a, um, a simplicial abelian group. But the reason somehow why I've written it um, like this is somehow that uh, there is this um, fun observation now that uh, I really see that this Dalt Kahn correspondence here, it is a categorification of this Newton correspondence. Yeah, so that means if I, um, right, if I assume, let's say that these, um, these abelian groups BK here, which appear um, have finite rank, then I can pass to rank, can pass to the numbers which are given by the ranks of these big BKs. These will then be the little BKs. And then here I have this binomial, um, I have this binomial coefficient, and so this binomial coefficient counts also precisely, as you can easily convince yourself, it counts precisely the number of surjections from n to k. And so therefore, um, two objects here are in Dalt-Kahn correspondence, um, 
will imply that um, the sequences of numbers I produce by passing two ranks will be in Newton correspondence. So I should say this is actually something which, um, uh, so I don't know where this is documented really, but I learned this um, observation. Uh, I think I read about this in some blog entry, maybe on the NLAB or something, but this um, observation that the Dalton Kahn correspondence actually decategorifies to this Newton correspondence is actually due to Andre Trial. So at least that's, I don't know, that's, uh, it was attributed to him in the, uh, in the place where I, where I read it. I don't know, maybe someone can comment on, on this, uh, in this audience, I'm sure. Um, okay. And so, um, so maybe for, for later on, um, we will also note that there's maybe a little more um, appealing formula um, for um, this construction here, which we will then also refer to later on. So let me let me actually just maybe write it at this point already. So um, so one way to think of this of constructing this um, inverse here um, is um, as a right adjoint uh, of this normalized chain functor, and then you get this um, formula which you can somehow nicely use uh, to compute this. So um, using the fact that this is a right adjoint, you can therefore somehow produce the um, n simplices in this um, simplicial object given by the nerve of such a chain complex by um, linearizing um, the simplicial set, which corresponds to the standard um, n simplex, and then you take chains and then you apply this to this um, complex that you have started with. And, um, and then this is going to be a formula for precisely um, the value, right? This is gonna be isomorphic. It's not completely obvious to see, but um, this is going to be another description, which is somehow a bit more natural because there you immediately see the simplicial structure by um, letting it act on the first component here, right? So and this is these are homomorphisms of chain complexes. Anyway, so that's um, what we're going to use later. Okay, and so now, um, as promised, um, we would like to go one step further and um, perform um, another um, step of categorification. Um, what we would now like to do is we would like to replace um, abelian groups with um, stable infinity categories. And so maybe before we do that, so one thing I just wanted to note is like, um, of course, some of this Dalton Kahn correspondence, it appears in many places. Um, one interesting thing, um, one interesting application, if you want, of it is somehow a construction of simplicial models for eilenberg maclean spaces, right? So that's somehow one interesting thing you can do. Um, so here, um, you can, for example, on the right-hand side, um, you can just plug in um, a complex, which is a pure complex, um, just concentrated in a single degree n. And then if you take this Dalton Kahn nerve, then you get a simplicial model for the Eilenbeck maclean space uh, for this abelian group um, in dimension n, okay? So this is, for example, one interesting feature, and we will, we will sort of see later that in the categorified context also, these sort of categorified eilenbeck maclean spaces, um, they somehow play, play an, an interesting role. Okay, so let's move on. So um, also if there are questions like, please, um, ah, so there's already a comment by Joachim clarifying, um, clarifying precisely the source of this, um, of this observation here. So thanks very much. I'll, uh, I'll note this down later. Okay, so so now we would like to pass to stable infinity categories. Um, so yeah, I was going to say if there's any questions, please just feel free to interrupt me at um, at any time. So, um, so yeah, so stable infinity categories. We would now like to, or um, I should say that th the reason for trying to prove such a statement it it, it didn't just arise the way I'm now um, sort of explaining it. Um, to you in terms of the exposition that I just looked at the Dalton Kahn correspondence and then you're trying to um, categorify um, just for fun. But actually the kinds of structures that um, arise um, via this Dalton Kahn construction, um, they, they somehow um, arise um, 
um, somehow rather naturally in a certain algebraic approach um, to, it, to, to what are called Fukaya categories in symplectic geometry. And so somehow this correspondence, it, it was sort of, it's an, it's an abstraction of exactly these algebraic features um, that you see in the examples um, that are studied there. So anyway, so um, here's what um, will happen. Now these abelian groups, sequence of abelian groups or simplicial objects even, will be replaced um, by simplicial objects um, where now the terms are stable infinity categories. Yeah? So each of these AIs is supposed to be stable infinity category. And similarly, on the right-hand side, each of these BIs is supposed to be a stable infinity category. And then what's going to happen, let me already state um, the results. So there's a few things to clarify here, I guess. Um, but now let me maybe just um, state the result. So, um, so it's a result, and as I first wrote a proof in, in 2017, but it was relying on a certain model of an infinity two categorical uh, Gordon deconstruction, which, um, which we then supplied in joint work with uh, Fernando Abelan Garcia and Walker Stern. And so that's what this other um, date here signifies. So that's also an important component of the, of the proof. And so this is now something that could be called a uh, categorified told Kahn correspondence. It somehow tells me that also on this level of, um, of stable infinity categories, um, there's, a, there's an equivalence of categories between um, a certain type of simplicial objects and um, chain complex of stable infinity categories. Okay, and so, so now let me maybe comment on this a little bit. So on what, what does this actually mean? So here there's this two simplicial, so that we will have to um, explain. And, um, and then we will maybe have to say a few words about how to construct the functors. So, um, so maybe let's start with chain complexes. So that's actually um, pretty easy to say. So here, um, what's a chain complex of stable infinity categories? It's really just um, a sequence of stable infinity categories. And this sequence is connected by exact functors, which are these differentials. And then it's just um, the condition that um, these squares um, to zero. Okay, so why is this a condition? Somehow maybe a bit unusual in this homotopy coherent context, you would sort of worry about, um, um, about um, some massive products, um, some higher massive products that need to also vanish. But in this situation, that's actually not the case because notice that it's actually property in this context that d square is, um, is, um, is equivalent to zero because the exact factors from, from B2 to B0, they form an infinity category. And what we're saying here is just that the object d square is a zero object and the space of zero objects is contractible. So there is no choice. So I don't have to worry about any kind of higher coherences, and that somehow makes the yeah makes the situation um, um, uh, simple here. So so that's kind of clear how to define this. And then the right hand side is actually less clear. So that's where kind of the fun begins. Um, and so so let me let me maybe say um, so what's happening here. So here. Um, we have this category which we write um, bold face delta. And so this category is actually defined um, as, again, it's going to be defined as a full subcategory, which is spanned by the ordinal categories. But now it's actually taken as a full subcategory, not of the one category of categories, but of the two category of categories. Okay, so this is a full, um, how to say, sub two category, right? Um, yeah, and so, so what this means is that instead of, right, so instead of looking at, instead of just looking at the set of functors between two of these ordinals, we actually look at, um, at the category of functors, and that's a you know, it's a pretty easy category because this is just a post set um, where the post set structure is given by the by the order of the of the target here, right? So this is actually now 
not just treat it as a set, not just as a set, but a post set. Yeah, so let's maybe call this guy here. So this is there for, um, right, so let's write it like this. So what this is really is um, delta n. So if I look at the collection of m simplices inside the n simplex, then that actually um, is this post set. Okay, so, so what does this mean? So just like you usually would draw a picture, let's say you try to draw a picture of the two simplex two simplex and then you try to draw the vertices. So the kind of picture you would usually draw is a picture of the two simplex. And then um, here are the vertices. So here we have zero, one, and two. But what we now also remember in this story is that there is actually an arrow from zero to one, an arrow from one to two, and that there is an arrow from um, zero to two. And then maybe one more example. If we look at the um, edges, then what um, what do we imagine? Well, usually um, we would have, uh, let's draw this a little better. So usually we would have, um, so usually um, we would have the set of edges in the two simplex. So that's going to be including the degenerate ones. It's going to be 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. Then there's going to be 0, 2. And there's going to be 0, 1. There's going to be 1, 2. But now there's also all these arrows, right? So there's an arrow here, an arrow here, arrow here, arrow here, 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 here. Okay. So, um, and so this is information um, we keep um, we keep track of um, so um, which which means that um, in between these um, various phase morphisms also all these natural transformations have to act and so that's what it means um, to write down such a two simplicial stable infinity category so I really have to write down representations um, of these post sets um, what does this um, imply so one of the things it actually implies is that due to these addition, additional um, morphisms um, or two morphisms, what's actually happening is, so this is something I can see, for example, here, so that there's actually going to be certain adjunctions. So and what's gonna happen is that D0 will turn out to be um, left adjoint to S0, will turn out to be left adjoint to, to D1, D0, left adjoint to S0, left adjoint to D1, left adjoint to S1, left adjoint to D2. Um, and so this happens because um, in these two morphisms, you will find natural um, unit and co-unit morphisms, which exhibit exactly these phase and degeneracy maps as being adjoint to one another. So for example, here along this edge, you will see, um, right, so this morphism on this edge here, if I just look at this edge here um, from zero to one, then this morphism here um, will actually be a, an example of a co-unit um, and this morphism here will actually be an example of a unit um, respectively for this adjunction here or for this adjunction here. Anyway, so, so that's sort of a new feature that we don't just write arbitrary simplicial objects, but somehow the phase and degeneracy maps, um, they have to be adjoint to one another. And somehow um, the, the technical nice way to actually say um, that these are adjoint to one another. I could, by the way, also say this on the underlying simplex category, because um, for each of them, um, even in the simplex category, I see either the co-unit or the unit, which is actually just an identity. So I don't need the two categorical structure to say that they're adjoint to one another, but it's just very convenient and also heavily used actually in the proof that you exhibit these adjunctions by, these, um, by this additional two categorical structure. Um, there's actually work in progress by Fernando Abalan, which uh, he, he may actually um, uh, comment on uh, later on, that um, uh, there's actually another equivalence of categories between these two simplicial um, categories and simplicial categories such that all these adjunctions hold. So in some sense, that's really all the two categorical structure does. It's to exhibit these adjunctions here. 
Okay, so are there any questions um, at this point? Um, otherwise, um, I would now like to move on and um, explain to you a little bit how to construct these um, functors of um, normalized chains and of the of this um, categorified um, dot Khan nerve. Okay, so um, so let's see. Um, so before we do that, right? So our tasks, our task is now. I told you what the objects are on both sides. Here we have these um, two two simplicial stable infinity categories. Here we have these chain contexts of stable infinity categories, and so now um, we would somehow define these functors C and N. Of course. You know they're supposed to have something to do with the factors which we have um, in the classical dot kind of correspondence, and so now um, what I'm going to what I'm going to tell you is sort of certain rules which we're going to apply, um, in the sense that whenever we see some expression in this classical context, let's say, then we would like to replace it by something else in the categorified context, and then, then we will sort of have to make sure that. Um, that this can actually be done and everything fits together um, nicely. Okay, so therefore we have to sort of um, clarify um, how to lift or how, how the sort of um, strategy should be to lift these constructions. Um, and we will do this by kind of looking at these symbols, right? So, so we see here, we have these abelian groups. Um, those we have already said are supposed to be lifted to stable infinity categories. Then what we now have is we have these um, we have these alternating sums, if you want, of elements um, eventually in these abelian groups. So those um, will have to be lifted to some categorical constructions, and then well, we will have to see. So there is, for example, this sum expression. So there is somehow one question um, to how how to lift that and so forth. And so that's what I'd now like to um, explain to you. So and now this is maybe something which doesn't only affect this told Kant correspondence, but in some sense, these should sort of be universal rules. And um, one kind of uh, fun thing you could do is you just kind of open a book on homological algebra, you look at any example or any interesting construction, and you try to apply these rules or maybe a version of these rules and, and, and find a categorical replacement. And, and, you know, I think there's strong evidence that actually such a subject can be developed in a rather systematic way. Um, um, and we're just kind of looking at one specific instance of, of, of how this works. Okay, so um, what are we supposed to do? A billion group replaced by stable infinity category A. If we're given an element in this abelian group, then presumably we're supposed to replace this by an object X in A. So we will now switch from small letters to big letters. And then the first, um, Kind of interesting question arises because here I'm sort of um, at a loss of what to do. So there's these alternating sums here that appear in this expression. And um, and so it's kind of not completely clear what I should do here. And um, so there's various proposals you could come up with. For example, you could just somehow say, okay, I take y, I take an object y, and then I add to it its, um, its uh, suspension. Right, that would be that would be on the level of uh, Gordon groups. That would certainly recover this difference, but that turns out to be a bit too naive. Um, so what you really want to do is a, actually a, a sort of more general version of this construction, namely, um, more generally, you will get this difference on K theory um, if you take just any cone with respect to any chosen map F. Okay, and so that's now sort of a, a basic rule of thumb. Whenever you see a difference in this classical um, homological algebra context, then there has to be a morphism F between these two corresponding objects given to you. Otherwise, you don't know how to take the difference. Okay, and so now you just take the cone or um, cofiber, whatever language you prefer, and um, that's then supposed to be a replacement for the difference. Now we have these alternating sums. And um, now, of course, you could you could sort of say you can re you can kind of inductively um, reduce alternating sums to um, to these um, um, iterated cone expressions, and that's indeed true. But um, there's actually a more um, clever way to kind of categorize this in a one 
in a one go and that's um to um and that's to take a totalization of um and this guy here will actually be a complex complex um in in this um stable category a okay so we will say a few words what that's actually supposed to mean and how to totalize but um you know this this is what's um what's going to happen and um then maybe the last question which we will have to address is um what's uh, what's supposed to happen to the sum and that's maybe the most um that's maybe a little subtle so i don't want to talk about it too much um this sum is supposed to be replaced to something which um, I don't know. At least in the context of algebraic geometry, this is what um, will be called a semi-orthogonal decomposition. So it's something like a. Um, it's something like instead of just having a, a sum decomposition of C, it's you should think of it as writing a C as in some sense an extension of A by B, which is split but somehow being split as an extension on the categorical level, it doesn't just apply that it's a direct sum decomposition, but it applies that it's something, um, well, semi-orthogonal in this sense. What does it mean? It means th there's no morphisms from B to A, which means only the zero morphisms. Um, and also um, every object in C can be uniquely expressed as the cofiber of a morphism from A to B, okay? So in other words, the category C can be identified via this semi-orthogonal decompositions as morphisms from A to B inside, inside C. Anyway, that's we probably won't um, address that too much because this will also not be um, our method of, um, of lifting this um, formula here to something categorical, but rather what we will do is we will lift this formula here um, to the categorical level. Anyway, so, um, so therefore, Let's try to understand um, what we're um, supposed to do here. Uh, so let's start with actually trying to categorify this, um, this functor C here of taking normalized chains, oops, following exactly these, um, following exactly these rules. Okay, so description of this chain functor. So what are we supposed to do? Okay, so now what have we given? We're given this um, this two simplicial um, stable infinity category. Yeah, that's what we start with here. So S T delta, and now we're supposed to form this chain complex. Okay, so how are we supposed to do this? Well, let's say um, we want to define the first differential. So what do we do? We take an object. Um, let's maybe call um, let's maybe call this object um, X. 0, 1. So this is now an object in A1 um, moduli. So, so the bar is actually just kind of the same thing. I just um, take um, the subcategory generated by all degenerates and then I just, um, I just um, kill this. So that's actually not a problem. But now the interesting part is how do I get a formula for, um, for the differential of this, um, of this object. Okay, so what do I do? Well now, um, what we remember is now we have in this, um, in this uh, two simplicial object, um, we now have these additional natural transformations, which actually, um, right, so let's maybe write some formulas. Let's just write the D1 of X01. Let's introduce some suggestive notation that we just um, uh, refer to as X0. And then this um, D0, we just refer to X1. And so now the two um, simplicial structure here, it means that I also have a natural transformation from D1 to D0. Yeah? And so that means that I have a morphism from X0 to X1, which is already part of this two simplicial object. So I do already have a morphism from, um, D, from X0 to X1. And so this comes from from exactly this natural transformation, which is part of this two simplicial structure. And now I can just take its cone. And that's my definition of the differential of X01. Okay, so far so good. Um, and so that means 
uh, this is exactly what I meant. Like sort of by design, when whenever I'm in the situation that I have to take something like a difference, um, I want to be given the morphism um, sort of with respect to which I have to take the difference. Okay, so similarly here, um, I um, in the next level, let's maybe also look at this because then it becomes a bit more interesting maybe. So there, um, what do I have? Well, again, um, I have these natural transformations relating the faces. Now that will be a picture which kind of looks exactly like this, yeah? Like what we have drawn in this picture here. And so how does it look therefore? Well, what's now captured by this um, too simplicial structure is there's the following diagram. I'm again using the su same similarly suggestive notation as above to denote the faces of this um, of this two simplex. I have a morphism to x zero two. I have a morphism to x um, one two, and now this actually can be written. It factors through um, the degenerate x one one. Okay, but this guy is degenerate. And so we have killed it, right? Because we have modded out by all degenerate um, uh, objects. And so this guy will actually now be um, just a zero object. And so therefore what we see is that we have this diagram um, and that's a diagram in um, this category A0 bar. And so this is the infinity categorical version of a complex. Yeah, It's just two morphisms to, together with a zero homotopy of the composite. Okay, and now what I want to do is I want to totalize this. And that's going to be my um, differential. And so now I have to explain to you how to totalize. And so how does this go? So remember the cone, what do I do to define this cone? So let's maybe go back one more step. What's one way to think of the cone? Well, one way to think of the cone is that I start with this morphism x0, x1, and then I complete it to a bicartesian square, which looks like this, right? By some kind of sequence of Kahn extensions, if you want. So I form this bicartesian square, and then by definition, whatever is here, this is the cone. And so now in this situation, there's um, there's uh, there's a, just a very similar way to do it. It's just a kind of happening one dimension higher. So I'm looking at this complex, right? And this square, um, or this sequence here, square is not necessarily by Cartesian, that's the whole point. And so now I can complete it in exactly the same way, just filling in zeros here, zeros here, zeros here. And then, um, and then I, again, by Kahn extension, I can form the totalization. And then that's by definition what um, we mean by this totalization. Okay, and then of course you can also, as I was saying, you can, um, you can do this um, successively by first um, taking cofibers of each of these morphisms in the in the above square, and then you know. So there's a there's a kind of inductive procedure which reduces this computation into a sequence of these computations. But so it's kind of it's it's good. We will see that later to have so to be able to refer to these higher dimensional pictures, which um, allow me to totalize such a complex um, in one go. Okay. So the next highest level. Uh, so we should also maybe. Should be a new tech symbol here, which is like a for a bicartesian cube, um, right? So this is a this is a it's a limit um, and a co-limit cube um, at the same time. So I think this uh, would have appeared in, for example, Tashi Wilde's talk already. These kind of cubes. Are we? Yeah. Question: Did you yes. mean to put a zero on the front top right? Uh, front top right. Yeah, there's a zero here. Yes. Here, there's a zero. Yeah, so these are all zeros. And then there's one guy left, um, which is going to be the totalization. Just like here, I put one zero, and then there's one guy left. If I then do left con extension, then I recover this vertex. Right, so I do a right con extension to fill in these zeros if you want, and then I do a left con extension to fill into the totalization, and then that's the totalization of this complex. So that's kind of the... That's how these longer complexes look like. They're higher dimensional cubes, if you want, where half of the vertices are zero, and then the remaining vertices, they kind of snake through the boundary of that cube and um, exhibit this expression, x0 through xn, as an actual um, 
complex in the homotopy coherent sense, right? That's what this really um, is supposed to say. There's supposed to be a zero homotopy corresponding to the spec square. Yeah? Then there's a zero homotopy corresponding to the right square. But then both of these zero homotopies are supposed to be identified and that's going to be, um, that's going to be done by filling in this whole cube. So it's kind of a neat, oh, thank you. neat thank higher dimensional picture, which, um, which directly captures this. Also like, so such cubes really do appear in nature, by the way. So um, at least if you, if you consider not theory as nature. So one fun context in which exactly this totalization of higher dimensional cubes um, appears very explicitly is actually Khovanov's um, construction of his, um, of his categorification of the Jones polynomial. So I, I invite you to look at it. So he, he actually um, sort of wouldn't do it in this one, um, one step uh, construction, but he but he he certainly does uh, something like this, where the dimension of the cube actually corresponds to let's see to the uh, to the number of crossings of the of the knot diagram, which you use to 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 present your knot. Anyway, so it's a it's kind of a fun um, a fun way in which this higher dimensionality of um, of infinity categories enters. Okay, and so, so so that's it. So now, just like you will be in your homological algebra course, you will be assigned the homework problem to check d squared um, is d squares to zero. This is also a homework problem here. Anyway, so that's the construction of this guy. But that's comparatively um, simple to do. What's a bit more um, elaborate to do? Um, that's where somehow um, most of the creative work I would say goes into is to describe the categorification of this nerve. So that's um, what I'd like to explain um, a little bit now. So, okay, so here, so I'd just like to do this in a sequence of two, um, two, two sort of examples. First, how would I categorify a one simplex in the classical Dolt-Kahn nerve? Um, and then how do I categorify a two simplex? And then we will somehow um, be able to produce a general formula. Um, okay. So here um, is how uh, one simplex in the nerve looks like. And now I'm gonna use this somehow, I'm going back, there were these two formulas, either I kind of just write down this formula here, or um, I can identify it with this expression. And now that's the expression I'm using. Um, so it's just chain maps from the chain complex of an N simplex into B. And then if you work out what that is, that's going to be precisely what we write here. All right, so such a chain map from the chains of the of the of an edge into B, what does it amount to? It amounts to selecting um, certain elements x zero one in B one, x zero x one in B zero, and then they're supposed to be related. That's what makes this um, a morphism of complex in the formula we have just um, recovered one more time. It's saying that if I apply the differential to this object x zero one, then I get the difference x one minus x zero. Okay, now our task is to find um, a categorification of these uh, formulas, sort of following um, the rules that we have imposed here. Um, okay, and so, he so here's how we can do this. Um, so now, um, what's going to be a one simplex in this categorified nerve? Well, um, it's clear how to uh, what to do with the um, elements. Those will become objects x0, x1, x0, 1, b1. And then we just remember, okay, whenever I want to form such a difference expression, then I need to be given a morphism between x0 and x1. So what do I do? Well, I just specify the morphism as part of the data. Okay, so that's now something which wasn't which was sort of invisible on this decategorified level. That's something that I now provide here. So I provide this morphism zero x one, and also I have to lift um, this um, equation here. So the differential of x zero one has to be um, identified with uh, with a cone of x zero to x one, and that's exactly what this um, what this exact triangle here um, signifies. Okay. Um, now, unless there are any questions, let's move to the two to, to two simplex. So so that's sort of where um, the maybe more interesting stuff begins um, to happen. So again, 
I wrote for you how to think of a two simplex in this um, classical dolt Kahn nerve. That's kind of, you can think of it as a decorating a simplex by elements of exactly the, um, of exactly this form. And then there's some equations um, that need to be satisfied. And these equations are exactly these. So for every edge, there's an equation of the kind that we have already seen. And then for the two simplex, there's an, one new equation, which is exactly this guy here. Okay. Um, and then we can, um, we can try to lift this. So again, objects is kind of clear. And, um, and then um, we have to make sense of these equations here. So in, in order to be able to make sense of them, we have to provide certain data. And that data is a sequence of, you know, we need a morphism from x0 to x1. We need one from x1 to x2 and one from x0 to x2. It turns out that um, the right thing to do this is to just, uh, you know, produce a sequence of these morphisms like so. And then to make sense of this expression here, I actually specify um, some new gadget, and that's a complex, right? So this is now a three-term complex. And then it's clear how to lift these equations. I can now, um, I can now, well, these equations are clear. They're um, already happening on the level of edges below, but then the new equation will be that the totalization of this three-term complex is precisely the differential of this object x012. And so I need some, you know, some, um, uh, a little longer exact um, sequence of exactly this kind, which, you know, you, you can think of it as exactly this cube. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so that's what's morally supposed to happen. But now, of course, the way we express this is uh, probably a bit too naive. I mean, sort of in the end, we have to assemble all this data in some, you know, in some uh, way so that it forms a two simplicial object. So we should probably find a bit um, of a more systematic um, construction. And um, so here's, here's how the construction goes. So um, the more precise version. Um, so, um, so here's how you really would define um, the category of two simplices um, in this categorified nerve. Okay, so what you see here is a certain diagram. And this diagram, it kind of combines all the data that we have written here on the right-hand side um, in, in the form of one single diagram, okay? And so this diagram is kind of a hybrid diagram. One part of the diagram, so I use, try to use different colors here, one part of the diagram lies in B0, right? Because these are just objects in B0. Then there's a blue part of the diagram that lies in B1. Um, that's um, exactly these guys here. And then there's this um, yellow part of the diagram, which lies in B2. Okay. So wh where, where does this diagram actually lie? Um, right, because it kind of mediates between different categories. And then, you, and then probably here, I don't have to explain um, how to do this. Um, this is a diagram in the total space of um, the Grotten deconstruction applied um, to this complex B. Yeah, so I think of this as a Cartesian vibration over the natural numbers. So that's exactly where, where I then get these arrows from B0 to B1, from B1 to B2, lying over the natural numbers. And then this is a diagram inside this Grotten deconstruction, which um, is supposed to satisfy, um, supposed to satisfy certain conditions. And so what are these conditions? It's, it's kind of an interesting notion of um, relative um, limit conditions that I have and that are very nicely behaved in these Cartesian vibrations. So um, I'm not sure where this was really first introduced, this idea, but I, I learned um, all of this from um, higher topos theory um, of, of, of Jacob Lurie. So these are, so all of the squares you see are actually what are called relative pullback squares. Uh, so first we should maybe say as usual, the degenerate ones, they're supposed to be zero objects. So this one is zero. This one is zero. All these are zero. All these are zero. So that what you see is that this um, diagram x0, 1, x0, 2, x1, 2, it really now becomes a complex in exactly the way we want it. Um, and um, now we impose um, additional conditions and these are relative pullback conditions. Um, so these squares here are what are called relative pullback squares. So let me maybe, so careful, 
So these are relative pullback squares. What does this mean? It means here I have a, here I have a square which kind of lies halfway between B0 and B1. So there are certain maps from B0 to B1. So what I can do is I can take this whole diagram and kind of move it um, using the fact that this is a Cartesian vibration. I can move the whole diagram via you know applying some Cartesian edges into B0. And then after I have moved it, it has to be a um, it has to be a pullback diagram actually in B0, which means a bicartesian square. What's really happening? Well, moving this diagram back into B0, it means that I just apply um, the differential to the blue part of the diagram. So therefore, for example, this first square here, x0, 1, x1 to x01, um, this being a relative pullback square after having moved it back into B0 is precisely one of these exact sequences here. Yeah, so then, um, you know, these are also relative pullback squares, but that just means that they're actually absolute pullback squares. The blue one, uh, sorry, no, that's actually not, uh, that's actually exactly wrong. This is not a relative pullback square, but what's true at the next level, so the, the next condition is that this cube here is again a relative, uh, how to say, a relative limit cube. Um, so this may be, again, I don't know if this is the right symbol. Is it the right symbol? Something like this. <laughs> so uh, this is a relative, relatively Cartesian cube, which means if I take this cube and I move it into B1, then it becomes a Cartesian cube. And after having moved it into B1, it exhibits precisely this, um, the fact that applying the differential to x01, I get the totalization. This is naturally identified with the totalization of this blue guy. I don't know. So I, I kind of think this is, uh, I just wanted to explain this in some detail because this is sort of the most um, direct maybe approach to, to, to somehow really grasp uh, what's happening. And now of course you can just write this down formally. So, you know, it's, there's a certain slice category which describes precisely um, diagrams of exactly this shape. And then you just map them into the golden deconstruction and you just impose these conditions. It's kind of easy to say. Um, so this is sort of easy to, after you've seen this picture, it's just very easy to do this. Okay. And then it's also, it, it's also kind of um, easy to organize this into a two-simplicial um, two simplicial object. So this is really the central idea to use this kind of a construction. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so I, I won't um, have time um, to explain to you um, the proof of this. It's kind of a bit technical proof of this correspondence, but let me say to just kind of reassure you that um, it's actually, so, so there, let, let me put it this way. There is a proof of the Dalt Kant correspondence. Um, it's probably not the one it's a proof which at least I haven't seen in this form anywhere, but there is a way to prove this Dalt Kahn correspondence in, in a rather concrete and explicit way, um, which you can then categorify step by step um, to provide a proof of this categorified Dalt Kahn correspondence. Um, it's, um, it gets a little technical. So there's basically two things you have to verify that first, first taking C and then the nerf, you get the identity and then taking the nerve and then see you get the identity. One of them is easy. The other one requires a bit of elaboration, which then refers also to precisely this, um, this um, infinity two categorical version of the Groten deconstruction. And so, so that technical part, it's, it's maybe kind of hard to explain um, in the form of a talk, but you know, there's a paper. So if, if, you'll, if you're interested in the details, um, I invite you to, to look at it but uh, it, it is really just implementing a certain categorification of a proof of the classical correspondence step-by-step step according to our rules. That's probably good enough for, um, for, um, for now. Okay, so now let's look at, therefore at examples of what we can do with this correspondence. What kind of objects um, can we construct from it? And so there are certain objects which we know already, which, um, uh, which we have um, seen before. And so these are precisely these, um, for example, these um, eilenberg mclean constructions, right? So you said we can just take a, a stable category, put it in one degree, and then apply the nerve. If you shift it in degree one, well, if you shift it in degree zero, it's not terribly exciting. You just get the constant object. But if you shift it in degree one, 
Then it turns out you get precisely the Waldhausen S construction, which is his model for the algebraic K theory of um, B, or rather, you should, I mean, you should say you get the obvious um, analog of Waldhausen's construction, but written down in, in the homotopy coherent uh, world. So, um, so that's what you get here. Oops. Um, now, other examples. If you take um, the category B and you shift it in, in degree two, um, then um, you recover a construction which due to Hesselhold and Matson, at least for abelian or um, maybe exact categories. And so, so the reason why they introduced this is because um, they were mainly interested in the situation where this category B um, has an additional um, duality um, specified on it. And then um, there's a um, version of K-theory which takes into account this um, duality, um, some kind of uh, Grotendieck-Witt um, version of K-theory, which turns out to be a genuine spectrum. And so a genuine C C2 equivariant spectrum. And to construct this um, spectrum uh, by an explicit model, um, Hesselhold and Matson use precisely this um, construction as a starting point and then produce some additional um, symmetries on the simplicial object and, and so forth. So, but you know, that, that, that's um, where this already appears. And then of course, th that's not something they did, but it's sort of a, a clear, um, it's kind of an obvious generalization, of course, um, after you see what they have done, um, which is to just shift, um, shift in higher degrees and um, and so this uh, this is something which has worked out at least for abelian categories um, by uh, by Thomas Puguntke. And so he actually um, also um, verified um, the meaning of this, which is probably what you would expect. Is namely that just like just like the Eilenberg McLean spaces, if they provide, of course, um, a a um, de looping of the Eilenberg McLean spectrum. And so these guys, um, if you shift them in higher degree, they also uh, provide a de-looping of the, of the algebraic K-theory spectrum. So it's sort of a, it's an alternative construction, which is, um, which uh, produces the same spectrum as the one you're used to from algebraic K-theory um, in terms of the iterated S construction, for example, let's say, but it, you know, it's, it's a rather different model actually um, to, to obtain it, I would say. So, 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 so that's why, just like this specific choice of a model is somehow interesting in this um, in this um, uh, Grotendieck Witt context, um, I think somehow maybe these models sort of are could be interesting for for something else. Um, anyway, and so then there's you can wonder what happens if you now leave this um, pure context and put them into different degrees, and then you see um, in the simplest example this is also a construction which is already um, well known. This is also introduced by uh, Friedem Waldhausen, which is which he calls the relative S construction. Um, and uh, is also uh, used by him, of course, um, in his approach to K-theory. Okay, so these are um, examples of objects um, that naturally arise um, through this, um, through this, uh, within the context of this dot Kant correspondence. And sort of, to me, it's it's somehow interesting that these constructions, which you may have all somehow seen separately, they, they, they are really part of this um, of this bigger context of applying this nerve to, to chain complexes of categories. That that's to me kind of just like a fun um, insight, if you want. So there's some applications. Um, so maybe some I don't know. So some kind of applications uh, which are uh, a bit egocentric, maybe. So this is a sort of uh, uh, I'm not sure how relevant this really is, but maybe it sheds some some light on um, on these um, higher Siegel conditions. Um, and so this is somehow that one um, can understand, um, one can fully classify, so to say. Um, those um, simplicial stable infinity categories, which satisfy um, higher dimensional um, even uh, Siegel conditions, and um, it, it's somehow part of a general idea, and that somehow goes back to um, right. So if you have a simplicial abelian group, then it's automatically a Kahn complex. So that's interesting, and you could somehow try to understand 
what is um, an analog of that in this categorified context? So can you somehow, can you do some horn filling games in for these two simplicial objects? Um, so I think this may actually be an interesting story. So maybe, so I think we understand it now in this stable context, but just studying, for example, two simplicial objects in um, other categories than stable um, infinity categories could be somehow fun and it may have some interesting applications. Mm. So I, I haven't really pursued this much, but in this context, you, you do see certain um, word filling conditions in the sense that um, there's certain, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a bit subtle how to define actually even what you mean by this. Um, what is this horn? You need a certain two categorical limit and to really um, compute it effectively, you probably want to use some kind of basic maneuvers in understanding these um, limits in terms of cofinality results and so on. Um, I think later in, in the talks by Fernando and Walker, maybe we, we will hear some, some more about that. Um, and then, but in any case, um, you know, you, you, you somehow, I mean, the, the idea is somehow, if you look at these horns, let me maybe sh say this, the time is kind of running out. If you're interested in these horns, um, you know, usually, for example, if you look at a horn in the two simplex, right, you start with a two simplex. And then you look at just a collection of two edges. So here's one edge, and then there's another edge, which then agree at this common vertex zero here. But in this two categorical world, there's actually more you should remember. Namely, there is this natural transformation um, from this edge to this edge. And, um, and it turns out that this is crucial in defining these horns. So defining these horns really refers um, very specifically to the two categorical structure. And also these statements which we're about to make, they're not true um, if you ignore the two categorical structure. Anyway. anyway, so then there's these restriction maps, these horn restriction maps, and somehow the fact that I can fill every horn, um, it's somehow replaced by the statement that these are localization morphisms. So they're somehow surjective in a kind of structured sense. And interestingly, you cannot necessarily um, fill all horns, but only outer horns, so these extremal horns. Um, so that may be a defect of um, what we're doing here, that we should maybe use a different category from the simplex category, but at least that's what we get. And then you can ask, what does it mean to be able to uniquely fill a horn? And um, that then precisely relates us to these, um, to these um, higher Siegel conditions. So somehow, if above a certain dimension k, you can uniquely fill um, any of these horns, then that just means that um, the simplicial object you're looking at is actually the nerve of a truncated complex. And then that in turn, it just means that the underlying simplicial object is 2K Siegel, right? So we see this in, in low degrees, for example, if you take the nerve of somehow um, the object B shifted in degree one, then that's actually an example of a two Siegel object, which is just the, um, the Waldhausen construction. And, um, and then it's also, it's also directly easy, maybe if you want to sort of uh, work out concretely what this means, it's easy to understand this kind of a horn um, filling condition. Okay, so that's, um, that's if you want some explanation, it, it, it somehow, um, I don't know, it puts these two K Siegel conditions, which, which may be sort of slightly mysterious otherwise in this kind of um, rather understandable um, context, I would say. Also, I should say this theorem due to the fact that we don't really have these results, we need to effectively um, manipulate the various limits that appear that that's actually not, um, not, yet, um, not yet written. But there's a decategorified version of that which is written. And so I think it, uh, it, it, there's a proof of that um, once we kind of have the technology in place exactly along those lines. Okay, so um, maybe the main applications that we're actually after in this context is somehow applications to um, to to certain categorical structures in symplectic geometry. So I'm now out of time. So let me just maybe explain um, in sort of an overview. So what what the hope is? So there are certain invariants you can associate to symplectic manifolds, which are called Fukaya categories. If you want, they're kind of so so maybe just you know 
to put this into some kind of a context, if you, for example, take the cotangent bundle of a manifold as the, as the um, input of a symplectic manifold, then what all this Fukaya category captures is really just the cohomology of the original manifold together with its cup product. Okay, so that's, um, and then there's kind of a more general version of that, which you can do for any symplectic manifold, which then has to do with Lagrangian sub-manifolds and so forth and so forth. And so there's one hope is that you can use this kind of categorified um, homological algebra to introduce you know, to basically categorify certain suitable constructions of, of homological nature, of which compute homology in some sense. And um, you can then um, provide a sort of purely algebraic description of these categories, um, which otherwise uses some, some, um, some um, partially heavy analysis, so to say. And so here's some examples just to conclude where um, we're trying to do this. So, um, so there's several contexts. Um, there's um, versions of Fukaya categories which you can compute for Riemann surfaces, which are um, non-compact, so they're punctured. And then there's a description which is based on precisely um, the idea that the S construction is something like a categorified um, Allen McLean space. So you ought to be able to compute something like first homology with it. And so there is a simplicial construction which does this in a in a intrinsic way, and it then um, produces for you this um, category. And then there's other constructions of a similar nature where you can now try to also do computations um, in higher dimensions. And so these are, for example, there's a version of computing homology with coefficients in what is called a perverse Schober. And the basic underlying structure of this is exactly the relative S construction you know, equipped with some additional symmetries. And then finally, there's some direct higher dimensional versions you can do with these higher um, versions, these higher um, Albert McLean spaces, they have to do with the homology of symmetric products. I think uh, Gustavo, uh, unfortunately couldn't come, I, I had to leave earlier, but I think Gustavo explained um, at least some of this um, in his talk. Okay, so let me, so I just wanted to give you some feeling for where, um, one would hope to apply these kind of um, simplicial structures um, or structured objects. And um, this is maybe the, the main place, uh, at least to me, of, 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 of interest. And so therefore, let me maybe conclude the talk. Thank you very much for your attention.